So I like to start with this video because nutrition advice in particular is all over the place, right? Because you've probably all heard things like, well, don't eat carbohydrates, don't eat fat, like which one is it? Um, and then you might hear also hear, don't eat protein, it'll explode your kidneys. Uh, things are all over the map, and so I just kind of like to preface this uh, with maybe like why that is with this video. So we'll just kind of start there, and then I'll uh, lead into our discussion. <laughs> Increase your chance of heart attack. Don't eat eggs. Oh my god. Thank you. You're welcome. Godspeed. Well, I guess I better take those eggs. Wait! Stop! You're mad! Yeah. We were wrong about the eggs. How? Well, it turns out there's two types of cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and eggs actually have both. So you can eat eggs, but just don't eat the egg yolks. So stick with the egg whites. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Godspeed! Wait! We were wrong about the eggs! Again? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so it turns out that the amount of cholesterol in a food doesn't actually affect how much cholesterol ends up in your blood. The eggs are probably fine. In fact, we sort of don't even know what cholesterol is. But the steak! You can't eat the steak! Why not? Turns out that red meat increases your chance of heart attack. You have to cut out red meat. So no steak! Thank you. Godspeed. Well, no, no steak, mister. We were wrong about the steak. It's the toast. Man was not meant to eat bread. What do you mean man was not meant to eat bread? Well, if you think about it, human beings should really only be eating what our Paleolithic ancestors ate. So, therefore, no bread, no toast. How do you know what our Paleolithic ancestors ate? Well, we, we just have to guess, right? I mean, we don't have any way of knowing I guess just um, ignore everything I've said and exercise. Exercise, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you guys could probably use it. You've been just sitting here for the last 35 years. It's been five minutes. Right. Time travel. All right, well, Godspeed. Turns out it's genetic. Doesn't matter whether you exercise or what you eat. I'm sorry I ruined your meal. I need 10 minutes. Do you want some eggs? I'd love some. Okay, so um, you guys already heard any of that stuff? Like, don't eat eggs. One egg yolk a day will give you cancer. It's just as bad as smoking. Red meat will give you cancer. Also, just as bad as smoking. Like, why are these things said? Like, why are these um, like statements made? We see them all the time. 
uh, you know, the hit that this hit on low carb, which is bigger right now. Like, what's the big diet right now? Do you guys, anybody have a guess? Like, what, what's or have heard? What's the big diet right now? Keto. Ketogenic diet. Who's heard of the ketogenic diet? Yeah. Uh, intermittent fasting. Raise your hands. Yeah, that's also kind of along with this. Intermittent fasting um, has been around for about 15 years, but it it kind of made a surge and then went away, and now it's back. And this is how nutrition goes. You hear it, it goes away, it comes back. I would say in about 10 years, low fat will probably come back and then carbs are the new king again. Um, and it's really confusing. Uh, so, and there's lots of reasons for that. Like one reason would be nutrition science as a field is extremely young. Like we haven't really been studying nutrition for very long compared to other things like chemistry. Like we're pretty, we're pretty good at chemistry. We know what's going on there. Nutrition is a lot tougher, uh, especially if we want to know what's going on with us. Like, can you imagine getting someone to eat a certain way for even just a few weeks? Like, if, you, if we all enrolled in a study right now, and they say, you have to go on the Atkins diet. Atkins diet is less than 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. Right? So that means no bread, no pasta, no potatoes, no corn, maybe a piece of fruit. You're eating meat and vegetables for the next six weeks. Right, how, do, how do you think, like, um, your adherence to that would be probably not great, even if you're in the study. And that's the way that we, the only way that we can control nutritional studies. Uh, and even then, what you probably would have to do is live in a, in, a, in a metabolic ward for that duration of time, and they would give you your food. I mean, nobody wants to really do that. And it's really expensive, so there's lots of reasons. So, hopefully today, my, uh, what I want to do for you guys is to talk about how you would be able to uh, analyze specific diets and determine like what is overall, what does a good nutritional plan and eating plan look like? Or what does a good diet overall look like? And you can then use this to uh, improve your own diet or if you hear some crazy diet, like the grapefruit diet, which is a real thing, which is only eat grapefruits every single day except for like one meal, uh, you weigh it up against this and say, ah, is that a good idea? And um, grapefruit diet is not a good idea, don't do it. But anything that comes along, because something crazy will come along, and you can use this as your guide, okay? So I just call this, what is good nutrition? Tenets of quality nutrition. All right, so first and foremost, I kind of have these as, um, Points and athletes in the room, this will look somewhat familiar, so just kind of if you see some familiar stuff, uh, there's a reason for that, because after nutrition, the basis of that is just general good nutrition, uh, so you're going to see some crossover. But first and foremost, what does a good nutritional plan do for you? It provides essential nutrients in sufficient amounts, all right? So we have six essential nutrients that we all need as humans to survive and thrive. And a good diet provides those for you in the amounts that are needed. And we'll talk about what those amounts are uh, a little bit later. But the focus here is on something called nutrient density. Right? And so if you've never heard that term, uh, it's pretty easy to explain. Consider, if you keep writing, that's fine, something like a plate of spinach. Right? Uh, who, can you, can you guys conceptualize a bag of spinach at the grocery store? All right, just like a, a normal bag, not, not a jumbo bag or anything. How many servings would you guess is in that bag? Just throw something out. Total servings in a bag of spinach. How many would you think is in there? Two. Oh, three. Got it right. Have I said that before? Okay, it's three. So that, that dull bag of spinach has three servings in it. That's a a big bag. Like think about like your general salad. All right. So with spinach, one serving of that, which is fairly large now, how many calories are we getting with that? A lot or a little? Very little calories. Is nutrition is spinach really good for you? Yes. So spinach is low in calories, high in nutrients. So we that we would say that is very very nutrient dense. It has a lot of nutrients per amount of food. And then also consider play cookies, <laughs> right? Uh, 
this would be the opposite situation. <laughs> we might have one cookie. If we equate these, one cookie I, probably has more calories than that plate of spinach. How many nutrients, vitamins, minerals, things like that are we getting with the cookies? High or low? Low, all right? So the cookies, we would say, um, are nutrient, or sorry, calorically dense. Lots of calories for not very many uh, nutrients. Okay, does that make sense? Nutrient density? So by and large, we would want to focus on foods in our diet that are nutrient dense. Is there room for this? 100%. Okay, 100%. Um, but for the most part, if we only, if this majority of our diet is calorically dense foods, um, we're not going to get the nutrients that we need. And we need those nutrients to survive, think, thrive, do physical activity. All right. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about how we get that. But that's kind of first and foremost kind of tenant number one. We need the essential nutrients uh, in proper amounts. So what are the essential nutrients? So here's kind of, I guess, how I've split them up. And here's kind of the take home message with our nutrients. If at all possible, it's not a great idea to limit severely or completely take out food groups. All right? Um, I split this up as more of foods than what you'll typically hear. So if our essential nutrients are carbohydrates, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, and water. But if you, we get all those through these categories. Right? We get all those through these categories. So right away, let's take that the Atkins diet, keto diet. What, what have we already violated with a diet like that? We've already basically kicked out an essential nutrient, which is carbohydrates. All right. Now, will you like spontaneously combust if you do, do the Atkins diet? You can you can live okay, but there's some certain considerations that you have to take. If you take out a group like carbohydrates, you need to make sure you're getting those nutrients elsewhere. Right. So that's just something we have to to consider, but in general, you don't want to remove food groups. So here's how I've uh, split them up, and in general, kind of what they do in the body. So protein, this is kind of what I call the do everything nutrient. Protein's involved in every single process, every single cell, every single tissue in your body. All right, and we'll talk about where you get protein and how much you should eat in a little bit. But from most people think of this as muscle building, which is true. It is the foundation of our muscle tissue, but it's also the foundation of our bone tissue. It's also the foundation of almost every cell in your body. And so if you want those cells to thrive, you need to supply protein for your diet. If you're an athlete, this helps you recover from things like me and Ox make you do, like heavy squats and deadlifts and bench presses. All right, That's the nutrient that helps your muscles recover. Uh, carbohydrates is our primary energy source. So if you've ever tried things like the keto diet or the Atkins diet and for two weeks you were like not yourself, you were like the evil, evil twin of yourself, the reason is carbohydrates are our main energy source. Um, if you're an athlete, large, there's a large chance that carbohydrates directly fuel your activity that you're doing. Um, so that's where carbohydrates gain their importance. So that's where it's an endurance nutrient as well. All right, also helps your brain function. On, on average, experts estimate we need about 130 grams of carbohydrates a day for optimal brain functioning. But that's how much our brain will use on a day, about 130 grams. So remember the keto diet or the Atkins diet is 50 grams, less than 50 grams a day. Uh, fat, also a source of energy for us. Right? We kind of know that a little bit. That's why uh, fat has somewhat gotten a bad reputation because it's twice the amount of calories as carbohydrates or protein but we still need it, um, particularly, uh, particularly for like recovery from training. It can help with endurance. If you're an athlete, it can also help with joint health and recovery. But interestingly, fat plays a huge role in our cardiovascular and heart health. Sometimes it's, said, it's labeled as a bad thing, but it, it can also help quite a bit. And we'll talk about what that looks like. Then lastly, uh, water and fluid for our hydration needs. So here's where we're going to talk about what you eat, okay? Here's where we're going to talk about 
All right, we have the essential nutrients. How do we know how much to eat and what are they? So how I've split this up is what is the nutrient we're talking about? Like where can you get it in food? When should you eat it? So now we're talking about timing. If you're, if you're like wondering, should you eat three meals a day? Should you eat six or eight? Or I heard you should eat every two to three, me two to three hours, six meals a day. This is where we're gonna address something like that, like a timing issue. And then how much you should eat. Uh, in a little bit, we're gonna talk about calories, but this will kind of naturally tell you how much you should eat of each group. Now, I, I kind of go with what I call the hand system. This might be new to you, some of you I know have heard it, some of you maybe heard it in other places, but amount will be dictated by some type of like region on your hand, all right? What this does for us is, if you're a bigger person, you generally have bigger hands, if you're a smaller person, you generally have smaller hands, right? And it will naturally account for how much food you would eat. Okay, so bigger people don't rejoice, small people don't eat. All right, I'm in the smaller category, so. Uh, these are general, all right? It might be something new to you again, but it's a good starting point. And we all, we generally have our hands with us at most times, right? So <laughs> it's something you can always have and use as a guide. All right, so let's start with protein. What are we eating here? I feel like most people know this one fairly well. We're talking about animal-based foods, animal proteins here, so beef, chicken, pork, turkey, um, fish, things like that are good sources of protein. And then of course our dairy proteins, milk, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, string cheese, and then eggs are, are also gonna be a really good source of protein here. Uh, we'll see eggs pop up a little bit later with the fat as well. This is, those are combo foods. Uh, anybody know, football players, you can't answer this. <laughs> Why would we choose Greek yogurt over regular yogurt from a protein standpoint? You may know. What is that? It has more protein than regular yogurt. Greek yogurt has twice the amount of protein as regular yogurt. Okay, so from a protein perspective, you get way more bang for your buck with Greek. That's why Greek is on here. Not that regular yogurt's a bad source of protein, you just get more of it per serving through Greek yogurt. Uh, then we have things like beans and legumes, and, and like nuts and seeds, and nut butters that also are going to be a little bit, uh, they have some protein in them, but not as much as the dairy-based proteins, or dairy-based foods, or uh, meat and dairy-based. Then we have things like beef jerky, and then of course there's protein supplements, which are going to uh, mostly be protein. Alright, now this is not an exhaustive list, but this should hopefully give you a good idea of the types of foods that we're talking about. With, with regards to protein. When should you eat it? Uh, I like every meal and snack with regards to protein. So even if you're not an athlete, it's a good idea to have some source of protein at every feeding opportunity. All right, there's good data to show, some good research to show that if you struggle with like later day binging or later evening binging, or if you get to the end of the day, you just like, you're like seafood diet, just throw it all in your mouth. Having protein throughout the day can help curb those cravings and, and tendencies. There's also good uh, information to show that it helps with your body composition, so how much body fat that you have or and lean tissue that you have. So even if you're not an athlete, this is a good idea. Now, how much? The, the hand size here is your palm, so both like the circumference, uh, circumference of it as well as the thickness of your palm. All right, that's what we're talking about with regards to the size. Um, typically, so two palms, at least two palms per meal, one per snack is kind of where you start. Most of the time, that is around 40 to 60 grams, maybe a little less if you're a female. All right, if you're like, you kind of like the numbers. And then there's some other things that you can use. You guys have all heard the depth cards for meat, right? This will get you about there for, for meat, three to four ounces per. Um, any questions on protein? Then we're going to move on. All right, so this is every time you eat things. So as I go through this, think in your head, okay, what do I do for breakfast? Do I get a snack? What do I do for lunch? Uh, and kind of start to fill in the gaps of where maybe you could improve. Okay, so next one would be the current bad boy of the nutrition world, carbohydrates. Or the evil, evil of the nutrition world. 
Um, there are plenty of good carbohydrates. Did you guys know that fruits are carbohydrate? I did, I did not learn that until a very uh, embarrassingly long amount of time. <laughs> that fruit is a carbohydrate. It's sugar, fiber, and water. That's what makes up fruit. And there's no bad fruit. So this, the first part of this list is all fruits, and every fruit is good. So this is, again, not exhaustive. There's not every single fruit on here. But there's no such thing as a bad fruit. So if you have someone saying, don't eat bananas because they're high in sugar, I'm pr I promise you that our health issues in America are not because of too many bananas. I promise you that, okay? Nutrition, again, can be confusing, but I'm, I'm very confident of that one. Okay, so any fruit's good. Now, what about the other stuff, like the starchy carbohydrates? They're fine, all right, they're fine. So things like white rice, brown rice, potatoes, which got a really bad reputation. Interestingly, sweet potatoes often get like the health seal of approval, whereas white potatoes actually, on the whole, has more nutrients except for something like vitamin A. Right, so just because they're white doesn't mean that they're bad. Oatmeal is great, whole grain cereals and things like that are good options. So you don't need to you don't need to avoid these foods. They're just fine. Okay, even if you're even if you're not an athlete. And then we have combo foods down here like beans and legumes, which we've, we've already seen. All right, you guys know that you can eat quinoa every day in the in the calf. Where is it at? It's at the salad bar. All right. So I think does that have like other stuff in it too, like beans and okay, it's just just straight up quinoa. Um, this is actually really high in protein as well. So that's a combo food. If you've never had it, it's a lot like rice. All right, it's a lot like rice. It's just little, little, little balls. All right. But all good stuff. Now, I don't think you need to eat the carbohydrates as often, and the reason for that is we have a method to store them in our body. So if they get low, we just can re we can use that storage where we do not have that for protein. All right. So you don't need it as often. Uh, size here. If you guys just cup your hand, okay. Two to three per meal, all right? Two to three per meal. Now, you can mix and match this if you want. You could go all here, or you could grab, you know, a piece of fruit is typically one of them, okay? A piece of fruit will typically be one of your cup handfuls. So just mix and match, do what you like, find the foods that you like, okay? All right, last one here, fats, or last one for the uh, kind of the main ones. Healthy fats. All right, now take a look at the list. This is what I'm talking about, that if we increase these types of fats in our diet, you see better health outcomes with things like heart disease or cardiovascular disease. Um, this is what we're low on as Americans. All right, typically we're just a little low, especially Midwesterners. All right, we love ourselves some beef and, and butter, okay? Um, but what are we talking about from a healthy fat standpoint? Extra virgin olive oil, walnuts, nuts and seeds, you'll see a lot of, are a big portion of this. Nuts and seeds are kind of like fruit. Some nuts and seeds get a bad reputation for whatever reason, and there's just, there's, they're not really warranted unless you have an allergy. So as long as you can eat these things, there's no bad, there's no bad nut or seed. So it's all game. And then, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this at the grocery store, but how big has the, has the peanut butter section gotten? It's like huge. It used to be like, all right, what kind of Jif do you want? Or what, do you want Jif or Skippy? And then Smucker's like really changed the game by coming out with a natural peanut butter that was literally just salt and ground up peanuts. And now there's like 50 of them. And you can get, if you want to, you can get walnut butter. You can get almond butter. Uh, you can get pecan butter. They're fine, all right, they're all good. The only thing I would say is if you're choosing these, the, the nut butters, make sure that it's natural, right? Uh, because non-natural, especially peanut butter, will have some unhealthy fats in it that we don't want to eat, called hydrogenated oils, all right? So that's where we kind of want to avoid with these butters. But as long as it's natural, uh, especially the peanut butter, peanut butter really is the only offender. Make sure it says natural on it, you're not getting those other fats that we don't want. All right, then other things like avocados, great, great source of healthy fat. So guacamole, all right, good to go. Uh, seeds, we got a bevy of them. They're all good. 
And then we have a few combo foods that we saw a little bit before, things like eggs and salmon. That will also help you have some increased healthy fat intake. Now, this I also like every meal and snack because as Americans, we just don't eat enough of them. All right, again, think how many of these foods do you get in your diet? If you don't, it might be a good idea to increase them a little bit. Um, now, this is the toughest of the hand, use your thumb, which typically for an oil is a tablespoon. And then you can kind of see what that would look like for, from a nut and seed standpoint. Two to three per meal. And then for snacks, guys, all these just assume half. Right, all these assume half for snacks. Are there questions on these three so far? Okay, now, um, Coach Ox can share these slides with you if you want to see these in a little bit more detail. I put these in here not to say that some foods are like really, really good and some foods are bad, but on the spectrum, remember, what's our first tenant? Nutrient density. The green ones are going to be the highest on that category. These are going to be our high nutrient density foods, and they're maybe not so nutrient dense, and then all the way to the other end, like cookies that are very calorically dense. That's what these are going to show. Um, so you can kind of look, take a, a, a brief look at these. Again, assess how much of my diet includes these foods. Uh, what are some foods that I could maybe increase or decrease just a little bit? But all of them, I want to say this, make sure that this is very clear, all of them fit somewhere. All right, all of them fit somewhere. It's not that man, if you don't eat everything from the green 100% of the time, I'm not going to be healthy or whatever. That's not the case. There's room in people's diets for these foods. Would you guys agree if these, these foods predominate the very high calorically dense, what I call calorie bombs? They're high in product fat, they're high in sugar, they taste really good, and you really don't get sick of them. Ever know what that like, thing is for them in their brain? All right? Those can be the issue if your diet predominates just too much. Would you guys agree, if we go back to here, these have somewhat of a limit. Eventually, if we keep eating them, we get a little bit like sick of them. But these are the ones that will meet that kind of first need of providing optimal nutrients. All right, last one here on kind of how much should you eat. I put vegetables in their own category. What's, what is a vegetable? Is a vegetable a protein, a carb, or a fat? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is one of them. Uh, vegetables are carbohydrate. That's kind of, if we lump them in with the others, that's where vegetables uh, will land. The difference between uh, vegetables and fruit here on this category, though, is amount. Remember our example of spinach? Per serving, spinach has about two grams of carbohydrates. Very, very low. Whereas something like an apple, a medium apple will have anywhere between 20 and 30 grams of carbohydrates. So very low. But these are our vitamin and mineral powerhouses. All right? Fruits and vegetables are our vitamins and mineral powerhouses. So that's why I gave vegetables its own category. Just like fruit, just like nuts, there's no bad vegetable. Carrots, for some reason, for a while, got like a really bad reputation for the same reason that bananas did. People were being told not to eat carrots because it was higher in sugar. And that's just like, that's the kind of stuff where you just got to be like, yeah, that's making sense. All right, so here's carrots. It's on there. Anything that's brightly colored vegetable is good. You want as many colors as you can possibly get with vegetable intake. The reason for that being, tomatoes have something that carrots don't have. Carrots have something that broccoli doesn't have, all right? They all have unique profiles of nutrients, so you need to make sure you're getting as many varieties as you can. If possible, every meal. I know breakfast here is tough, guys. Like in the cap, breakfast is rough. So if you can't get it at something like breakfast, maybe just focus on fruit that for breakfast. Or, or at lunch and dinner, Try to get through your snacks, increase lunch and dinner. That would be your best way here to get, get vegetables. Um, hand, using your fist as your kind of guide. Now that might seem like a lot, and it is quite a bit, 
you don't feel like, guys, you have to like go out tomorrow and be perfect at all this stuff. All right? The goal is choose something that you can do and just start doing it. And then over time, just add some stuff in. Okay, I think I've got my protein down. Maybe I should start eating some carbohydrates, some better options. Or maybe I should start eating some healthy fats, add some nuts and seeds to my snacks. That's how you want to work on this stuff. So I know that this seems a little daunting. And uh, personally, I, I, I know I don't meet it every single day. But you just work up into it. And here's some, again, a list of lots of options here. Lots of options here. If you're someone who doesn't like vegetables, um, I would say just keep trying. All right, that's the best advice I can give to people who don't like vegetables. Uh, try different methods of preparation. Try different ways to eat it. I always like to use the coffee analogy. Who drinks coffee? Only a few of you. Wow. Who loves coffee like right away? A couple of you. So if you didn't, you eventually kind of learned to tolerate it or maybe even started to like it. And the vegetables can very much be the same way. All right? Where over time, your taste, will, your taste will change, or maybe you ate it a different way that really made something click for you. So I just say try it. Be adventurous. You're young. Be young and adventurous with the vegetables. So here's what it could look like. All right? That's what, in a perfect world, most of your meals would look like. Again, think, how, where am I at on this spectrum? How close am I to this? Uh, and you, you don't have to be perfect by tomorrow or the end of this class or this semester or this year, but just kind of work your way towards it. All right, last thing here on the essential nutrients. Remember, so this is still, we're still on that number one here. And I promise you the next two are way shorter, but this is like what most people want to know. What should I eat? How much? Uh, our recommendation here with uh, fluid and water, if you're going to meet your hydration needs, is half your body weight in ounces per day. All right, half your body weight in ounces per day. A lot of people have heard like these set standards: eight cups of water, gallon. Um, not appropriate for everybody. Just not. It's that, and so there's some people in this room that's way too much. There's some people in this room that's not enough. So you have to individualize it to yourself. So if you're like a 200 pound athlete, you need 100 ounces of water a day or fluids, right? It could come from other things. It doesn't always have to come from water. So things like tea, coffee, juice, <coughs> bang energy drinks, right? Um, they contribute, they just might not be as good as water. Okay, so it can, be, it can come from anything. Or lots of different things. So that could be five 20 ounce bottles of water. Right, and this person's met their needs. Okay. Now, if you do a uh, workout or if you're an athlete, you will, you will sweat more than the average person and you need to account for those losses. Pretty easy. Just drink 16 ounces of water or fluids for every pound that you've lost through practice or training. Okay, so if you work out regularly, just weigh yourself before and after. It's a good barometer. Now, we all know this one probably. This is a way you can check every single time you go to the bathroom how hydrated you are. And this is a good kind of color scheme to go by. Um, notice how like the sweet spot here is right two and three. One, if you're up here and you're clear multiple times in a row, you might be overdoing it a little bit. You actually want to pull back just, just, a, just a little bit. If you're always, I would say if you're two times in a row, if you're urinating more frequently than once an hour, you're good. <laughs> you don't need to keep pushing it. <laughs> but down here, dehydrated, start drinking some water. Thirst is not a great indicator, so don't wait until you're thirsty. Just if you can, have something on you at all times where you can just drink, get, get a little bit, drink of water, and do it, do it consistently. Okay. Woo! That was a lot. Check any anything that came up that. Put a question in your head. Yeah. Overhydration. What's that? What is overhydration? Overhydration, like, how do you know if you're doing it? Like, what does it give you? Um, I guess in a simple sense, 
it, what, it, what it ultimately does, it will actually flush out electrolytes too much in your body, because every time you urinate, you're not only urinating out water, or just excreting water, you're excreting electrolytes like sodium and potassium. Uh, that can down the road be dangerous for a number of reasons. Most of the time it will manifest itself as like you just feel kind of weak. All right? I did this to myself as an athlete. All right? I, I was one of those athletes that was like, all right, a little is good, more is better. So I drank, uh, not quite this big, but I would drink, try to drink in high school, I'd try to drink about maybe this much every class period. Oh. So every 45 minutes, every time I would, you know, I'd be sitting like, you know, just looking at the clock, and then I'd bolt to the bathroom in between classes, and then I'd do it again. I, I, I never felt good in football games, never. I always felt weak, weak in the legs, couldn't push through things, didn't have good endurance, and now I think this was why. So that's in, in general, but it's because I was, I was excreting my electrolytes, which is not good. So that's what it will do to you. So again, two or three times in a row, hold back just a little bit. All right, next one. So that was number one, all right? I know it's a lot. These two will go much faster. So we've already talked about calories here a little bit with nutrient density, caloric density. We want to focus on nutrient dense foods, but um, we need calories, all right? We need calories to survive, all right? Uh, or it could be like with the, my dog here, okay? Calories give us energy. Calories are the energy content of our food. That's what, that's what they are. They're not good, not bad. They're not something to keep as low as humanly possible. They're just the energy content of your food. All right? Do you guys, you guys all know that we need a certain amount of energy to live? We need a certain amount of calories to live. It's called your basal metabolic rate. You need a certain amount of calories just to maintain life. All right? That's where calories will come, will come in. Energy balance. So the energy balance here is what is the difference between how many calories I'm eating and how much energy I'm expending. So when you guys do things like focus really hard on trying to listen to Coach Van Wyk, that uses energy. If you go and work out after this, that uses energy, that uses calories. If you go to practice later today, you are using calories. And that will tip the scale to this end. All right, depending on what you want to do, you then need to account for that by calories coming in. Now, if you're like laying on the couch all day, this is non-existent, all right? And so this would have to be adjusted for that. But here's my, here's my take home, here's like the key thing to get in your head with calories. What you take in depends on, number one, what your needs are. So athletes in general have higher caloric needs, they need more energy from their food because they are, are going to be higher on the expenditure side, on the output side. But it depends on your goal, all right? Also depends on your goal. So if you have a goal to gain weight, which of the which size needs to be higher on the weight gain side? If you're like an athlete or something like that, the intake side. If you are the goal of losing weight or losing body fat, this side will need to be higher. The scales need to tip to that side. If you're like I don't really care, I just want to stay. I want to be the same thing, the same weight. Then they've got to be the same. But there's no good, there's no bad, all right? It depends on what you need and what you want to do. That's the take home here with calories. So it depends on your goals or your needs. All right, so everybody got your phones? We're gonna calculate how many calories that you need. Approximation here. I always like to see people's reactions to this. Because some people have, most people have no idea. They have no idea how many calories that they need. So here's what you're looking at. Here's what you're doing on the day. So just take today. What are you doing today? Are you working out? Are you practicing? Are you doing nothing? Just gonna go after this class and go home and take a nap? What are you doing? What's your goal? Do you wanna lose weight? Do you wanna stay the same? Do you wanna gain weight? All right, take your body weight currently times these numbers and that'll tell you how many calories you need today. It's a range here. Notice it's not one specific number. We aren't computers. It's not input this, output that. It's a range. All right. So I only see a few eyebrows removed. 
Most of the time, that's what happens. They're not used to, people aren't used to looking at this number. All right, now ask yourself, okay, what does that mean for how much food I eat? That's a different question. That's a tougher question. Luckily, we've already answered that. All right, luckily, we've already answered that, okay, with the things like the hand system and portion size guides. Those will naturally get you to where you need to be, okay? Um, from, the, from that, you might need to increase on days you work out or athletes during camp. You might need to increase those up a little bit. Or if you're not doing anything and you need to maybe lose a little bit of weight, body fat, you need to go down a little bit. Okay, any questions on energy? Energy balance. Uh, controlling, your, controlling calories. All right, perfect. All right, third, so that's number two. Third tenant here is your nutrition, your eating, should achieve health goals, your body composition. So all you, can, all you need to think of body comp is, is just how, like, this is kind of a weight thing. How much do you weigh, what you want to weigh, do you have the amount of body fat that you want to have, or muscle, vice versa, that's body composition. And are you performing the way that you want to perform? Do you feel the way that you want to feel? All right, so if you're not, if you don't work out regularly, or if you're not an athlete, this could be, how do you feel? So you should be getting healthier, you should, you should uh, have the uh, kind of weight that you want to be at, the body composition you want to be at, and you should feel the way that you want to feel. All right, good nutrition, eating plans, do all three. All right, they do all three. So let's, let's go back to the grapefruit diet. Which of these three, performance, health, body composition, is the grapefruit diet not gonna do for us? If you go, if you go on the 800 calories a day, you're eating grapefruits or grapefruit juice, except for one meal a day, what's it gonna do to our, our nice Venn diagram? Like what's gonna suffer the most? Probably. Say that louder. So he said health and performance. What's going to really drop initially? Performance. All right? Do you think that you, so think about the calorie number you just looked at, and you can only have 800. For some of you, that's less than a third of what you need. <laughs> okay? You will, you, you give me zombie you after that. All right? You're going to be zombie you if you do that. And eventually, it's going to impact your health. Grapefruit's a fine food, but what do we say about fruits and vegetables? What's the goal there? What do we think about colors? Variety. Variety. Grapefruit's like orangish yellow, right? We need way more variety than just grapefruit. There's no way we can meet our vitamin and mineral needs by only eating a couple grapefruits a day and then having one meal that is also very low calorie. Not going to happen. And this might improve initially. But eventually, if you stay on that track, it would become an unhealthy thing. You have an unhealthy body weight, unhealthy body fat. So down the road, that's, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, meet any of the things that we're going for. All right, does that make sense how, that, how you can use this now? So another really, really popular diet right now is the meat only diet. Who thinks of this stuff? Like, come on. All right, so we're, I mean, again, you, the meat only diet will do this, all three of them, too. Okay? So, hopefully, that's my goal here. If you get nothing else, this gives you a way to assess I read about this diet, or my crazy aunt told me about this diet. What do I, what, what do I think about it? All right, last one. This is called, uh, this isn't a nutrition specific recommendation, but it's a mindset recommendation. If you decide to start something new, or if you're thinking, hmm, should I change anything right now? You want to be outcome based with your decision making. So this is asking the question at any point in time, how is this working for me? That's what outcome based is. So if you're thinking to yourself, I don't need to change my nutrition, I'm good. All right, we'll then go back to here. How is it working for you? How do you feel? How do you 
do you look the way that you want to look? Do you have the body composition you want to have? And, ha and is, how's your health? If these can improve, then ask yourself, eh, how's it working? Something can get better. My nutrition can probably improve. If you're an athlete, how do you feel? Do you feel energized during training? Do you feel energized at practice? Do you have, do you have mental clarity at most times of the day? If the answer is no to all those, how's it working for you? Your nutrition can get better. Right? This is kind of what, this is sometimes how I have to gently propose to people in my office who are like, my nutrition's fine, but then they're still meeting with me about it. <laughs> right? I feel like, well, you're meeting with me for a reason. So ask yourself, how's it working for you? All right? So that's all I've got. Um, any questions over any of that, or just yeah, questions in general? Because uh, I was told you all had questions. Right? I was told that you all had some questions. All right. What are some facts that we should stay away from? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. For sure. Okay, this is like the biggie to stay away from for sure. All right, how do you guys know if you're eating this or not? The latest food. food label. Nutrition label. Look on the back. It'll say hydrogenated, like, blank oil. Right? Or sometimes it'll say partially. All right, that's how you know. Um, if, you're, if you don't want to do that, Typically, things that have a shelf life of forever have those in them because it doesn't degrade. It doesn't spoil. That's why I can put a Twinkie right there and leave it there for the rest of the year and it will look the same in a year as it does today. Have you guys ever seen the, cheese, the McDonald's cheeseburger experiment? We could put a cheeseburger on there. Today and a year from now, it will look the exact same except just hard. It won't mold. It won't decay. It won't rot. It will just stay right there and dry out. That's a good indicator that you've got hydrogenated oils. Now, what about saturated fat? Okay, where do we get saturated fat? What types of foods? Cheese, right? What else? What's, what's the one that, what does margarine replace? We're supposed to butter, okay? Butter. You get it through some like meat, particularly beef. But interestingly, beef is also high in the same fat that olive oil is high in. Right, so meat's not just saturated. But these are typically what we think of, right? For saturated fats. So to answer your question, you want about a third of all of them. So you want a third of your diet being kind of this category, a third of your diet from, or then the rest of your diet from what's on, what was on the, the slide. What you don't want is like all of them coming, your, the, your, most of your diet coming from these foods. You, need, you just need to balance it out a little bit. But do not totally avoid these, keeping in with the theme of don't take out food groups. Good question. Other questions? What's the back best part Good question. All right, here's where I'm going to challenge a little bit here. When we, when we ask these best questions, what is the best, you have to go back to here. Find ways that you can to get this. So you have to kind of look at your lists here. All right, what from this list can I get quickly? What from this list can I get quickly? What from this list can I get quickly? All right, and then based on your preferences and what you like, try to come up with something. You might not have to do it now, but I guarantee you have to do it in four years or less. So it's good to start practicing now. Um, I will say, you know, Having food in the dorm is, is, is I think, essential. If you, if you want to improve your nutrition, you can't not have food in your dorm. 
Okay, you can't not have it. So there are things here that that work better. You know, yogurt, string cheese, jerkies are going to be a lot easier to have in a dorm room than others. You know, fruits easy to have in a dorm room. Most of actually most of this list is pretty easy to have in a dorm room, and then nuts and seeds are really easy to have in a dorm room. Uh, I will say, who here who here has tried overnight oats? Okay, so overnight oats are a really good dorm room food. Right there here. Because it's really easy to get them, get them all. So all you do is you take a jar or a Tupperware container and you throw in oatmeal, yogurt, maybe a little bit of milk, fruit, whatever you want, and then you put it in the fridge overnight and when you wake up it's ready to eat. The oats dissolve a little bit, they get soft, and you know you now have breakfast. You just open it up and eat. Okay. Yeah. And the prepackaged ones, is that official as the ones you make yourself? There, um, so the question is, were our uh, quick oats the same as? Well, there's like prepackaged overnight oats now. Oh. I, they're probably about the exact same thing. They're probably about the exact same. The prepackaged, you know, here's, what, here's what I'll say with that though. You're paying more for that. So from a shopping standpoint, because we're all poor college students, right? From a shopping standpoint, including me, right? From a shopping standpoint, the more you, the more convenient something is, the more you're going to pay. All right? That's just how it goes. So if you go and you buy pre-chopped broccoli, it's going to be more expensive than the head. Or if you buy oats, that all you have to do is add the milk, and it's already like there for you. That's going to be more expensive than if you put it in your own Tupperware container. So just kind of from a, a cost shopping standpoint. Also, bulk is going to be cheaper. You pay more up front, but per serving, it's it's not. So think about like the little thing of almonds that's somehow ten bucks, <laughs> and then a big bag that's like twelve. It's not quite that that drastic, but it's the similar concept. All right. Good question. Can you expand? You're about ready to on the uh, rolled oats versus instant oats. Right before you, she had asked that question. Can I expand on it? Yeah, like, should, well, what's better? Rolled oats or instant oats for these overnight oats that you were mentioning? Well, the, the oats that you find in instant are rolled. They're, they're basically the same, right? Um, the thing that you're getting with like the prepackaged oats that you just microwave, what are, you, what are you getting additionally with that? There's some sugar in there, right? I don't know if it's something, especially if you're active, that you really need to be worried about. It's just something to be aware of. Whereas the oats that like, that you would get in like the Quaker bins or the, the Quaker cylinders there, they just don't have that added. Okay. Um, then you have something like steel cut oats that take a long time to cook on the stove. I would say just I don't see much of a difference, honestly, between them. Choose what you like. Is that is that okay, Ox? Is that good? Yeah. Yes? Is consuming caffeine daily, is that like okay? Should we really try to stay away from it? Good, great question. So here's an interesting fact. The, um, our governing body in America, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, every five years puts out guidelines for Americans. The newest one that will be redone for the year in 2020 came out with a caffeine recommendation. And here's what it is. Up to three to four cups of coffee is deemed safe for regular consumption. Okay? How much caffeine is this? Anybody know? So 300? Yeah, it's about 300 milligrams. Okay, that's about 300 milligrams. And all coffee drinkers are like, yes! Bang drinkers, you're above this! So I just, just letting you know, bang is 365 or something like that. It's ridiculous. Okay. Okay, so the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has come out that up to three or four cups of coffee a day is deemed 
safe for daily consumption, so about 300 milligrams of caffeine. Here's what I'll say about this. Drinking a Bang or a Monster and coffee are very, very different. Coffee in nutrition science world is now on the level of tea, of regarding its nutrient content. Now, you're, I don't know if they're talking Folgers here, right? But coffee has some good stuff to it that we're just finding out about, similar to tea, that Bang and, and, and Monsters and other those things don't have. And then what are you also potentially getting with a Bang or a Monster or a Red Bull or the Rockstar? Those are also loaded with sugar, potentially. Potentially. Um, here's also here's like my last point on caffeine. Oh, let me ask you guys: Why does caffeine get a bad reputation? Like, why does everyone be like, "Oh, I should decrease my coffee"? You know, everyone says that. Could affect sleep. Okay, who in here like drinks caffeine and then like they can like see sounds and hear colors? <laughs> okay, so some of you know. Who here can like drink a cup of coffee and go to bed? Me. So our responses to caffeine are highly individual from that standpoint. In general, it's recommended to stop afternoon, like 12 o'clock. That's in general, all right? But you, you can, everyone's different. What's another reason we're told not to drink caffeine? You could be dependent on it. Yeah. How it's presented to you. Sure. Yeah. How about a health standpoint? Why are we why are we told not to drink caffeine? Heart issues. Heart issues. Heart, heart issues. So high blood pressure. That's the other other one. High blood pressure as a result of caffeine intake. Also highly individual. Right? Also highly individual. So Unfortunately, those of you who are very caffeine sensitive are likely, I'm not saying you are, you would have to like actually measure your blood pressure. You are more, probably a little bit more likely that you have a blood pressure effect. But it's not, uh, definitely not the same across the board. So you just have to know what you, what you are with regards to caffeine intake. Um, even then, who drinks caffeine as a pre-workout or like does it to like help with their training? It's also really effective, <laughs> okay? So my recommendation there, and if you are sensitive to it, I would use it strategically and time it up with when you train, okay? All right, other questions? How long are we going, Ox? We're long. How are we long? When does class end? 10.55. 55, okay. What else? Is it true that eating slower is healthier for you? Like eating your meal slower? That's a really good question. Um, define healthy. Let's define that first. Like, what what about eating slower is supposed to be healthy for us? Like, it lets you digest the food better. You like your body digest it, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, who's heard this? Yeah, yeah. Who's heard that it takes about twenty minutes for your brain to signal that you're full? Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty valid, actually. That's pretty valid. That. When you start eating a meal, about 20 minutes later, your brain is getting those signals that, yep, food's coming in, we're, we're good, we're going to survive to the next meal. You know, our Paleolithic ancestors, you know, they don't know when that next meal is coming, so they would just be like, ah, just eat all the food. By the way, still a little, I'll get to your question, side tangent here. The Paleolithic estimation of, of uh, living lifespan, you guys know what it was? Like 30. <laughs> Um, and the Paleolithic diet often is a meat, proposed as like meat heavy, like the caveman diet. Um, that might have been true if you were like, a, a, like an Inuit Eskimo, right? Or depending on where you like us, like our theoretical Paleolithic ancestors living in the Iowa Midwest region, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because that's what's around us. We don't have a, um, other things. But what if you're a coastal community? What are you eating then? You're eating fish. What if you live in a jungle? Fruits and vegetables. Okay, so the paleo diet, oh, maybe tigers, yeah. The paleo diet, it, you know, as we have kind of tried to guess, 
ranges from almost all animal, again, think Alaska, Inuit, Canada, or cold populations, to almost 100% plant, and everything in between. So that's why the, the video is funny, like we just kind of guess. Because um, the Paleolithic era was, in theory, 10,000 years in length. And I always laugh because uh, I did a research project in grad school on the Paleo diet, and the early Paleolithic peoples would have subsisted very much on organ meats because they did not have the tools to hunt so they were just left with whatever was left over so I'm like hey bro you're real paleo you're eating some brain right now but no one does that okay so anyway uh, let's get back to the 20 eating slowly from a digestive standpoint it may kind of help us digest our food but our digestive system, assuming that it's healthy, is very good at what it does. So if you eat very quickly, and assuming you chew appropriately, you know, if you, if you just like swallow it whole <laughs> or something, maybe a little bit. But our digestive system is really, really good at what it does. It's really good at uh, taking the foods you eat, breaking it down so that you can absorb it. The, the key factor with slow eating It's right here. All right, that's what slow eating probably does for us the most. It is very, very well supported that if you eat quickly and you're not thinking about what you're eating, if you're not mindful about what you're eating, this goes up, okay? If you think about what you're eating, if you take your time, you enjoy your food, you make yourself wait 20 minutes, 30 minutes before you get another, another uh, get get more food. This this goes down. Very very well, very good research to the point that um, a lot of systems to help people lose weight, that's where they start. All right, they start with okay. Your first goal is every meal now. You cannot or you, you know the recommendation is do not get seconds until after 20 minutes. Or, or don't change what you eat, just you have to take 20 minutes to eat it. And actually we'll do an exercise where they give you 10 raisins and say you have to take 10 minutes to eat those raisins. <laughs> and um, it's hard. And especially in America. All right, if you go to, I went to Italy a few summers ago. It was an adjustment because it's not, in America we get like, if, if, our, if, we, if we get an appetizer and an entree, if that entree isn't like right in front of our face or in front of our appetizer, we get a little agitated. If you go to a European country or out of the United States, just be prepared to wait. They do not do things as quickly. All right, so you may or may not get waited on the first 10 to 20 minutes, and then when you order your food, you might have to wait a little bit. It's just a different pace. So from that standpoint, it's probably more of a uh, control your energy intake, and those signals do take time, usually 20 to 30 minutes to reach your brain and you'll find out you don't eat as much. Now what, what are some situations where that would not be a good recommendation? I'm looking over here. Like Brendan, like what do you what do you need that would not if you tried to like all of a sudden eat slowly and mindfully all the time, what would happen to you? Um, I mean not enough time to eat. You don't have enough time? What about from, what would happen with this? And then we just need so much more food. Yeah. Athletes sometimes, it's not great advice, but for general weight loss, it's good advice. Okay. Good question. Does that answer your question? All right, good. Other questions? So like, Last year, I know like my schedule, like on Tuesdays, I had a lab, a chapel lab. Mm -hmm. So like I had no time for lunch, mm -hmm. ever, mm -hmm. on Tuesdays. So like I'd eat breakfast at like 7 o'clock, and then I'd eat supper at like 6.30 without a meal. Mm -hmm. What should you do if you go and you're going to not have a meal? And like, it's actually impossible to like have a sit down meal. Yeah. Um, have food with you as much as possible, because there's walk time between stuff, right? There's there's five to ten minutes of walk time in between. Then you just try to have some food in your bag. Maybe it's a bag of nuts, 
Uh, maybe it's a protein bar, maybe it's a piece of fruit, um, stream cheese, things that are portable that you can walk and eat and open and eat, it's not gonna spoil in your bag. That would be, I would say, first and foremost, my recommendation. The other way would be maybe adjust at breakfast a little bit. Maybe since you know that lunch is going to not be there, your breakfast is a little bit bigger if you're, if you're able to do that. And that way when you get to supper, you're not so ravenously hungry. Okay, I mean, because you have, have you experienced that where you get there and you're just like, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so first and first foremost, see if you can have some, some portable food with you, which again, is, it, it's pretty easy. You know, you just you have to find what you like. Snack on that as you're walking to and from. And if you can't do that, maybe adjust for breakfast. Get a little bit bigger breakfast on those days. Is that good? What ratio of water to sports drinks do like uh, a student or an athlete have in their like daily? Uh, so a general student versus an athlete? Uh, I would say if your workouts are like less than 60 min minutes, in general you don't need, you probably don't need an electrolyte beverage. You probably don't need something like a sports drink. Depending on what it is. If it's super high intense, like a CrossFit or high intensity interval training, and it's like a legit 60 minutes, 45 to 60 minutes, maybe. It just depends how much you sweat. Uh, if you're an athlete, I would. Depends on your goal. Like if you're if you're needing to lose weight, maybe not be good to rely on, but gain weight. That's actually a way to get in some calories. So I would add those in. But in general, I would save them for after practice as a, as a rehydration beverage. So. If, you know how we talk about every pound you lose, 16 ounces of fluid? Those are those work really well in those situations. Uh, but for the general person, if you're not training, it's really not necessary. If for those populations, if someone just doesn't want to drink water, they want something flavored, I would err on the side of the non-caloric versions of those. So Propel, uh, Powerade Zero, and now there's like a million different non-caloric water type beverages like ice and LaCroix and whatever else is out there. Those, is what, those are what I would focus on. If you're an athlete, and, or if you're, gen, if you're just general pop, or uh, not an athlete but you work out less than 60 minutes, probably not super necessary, especially for eating a good diet. If you're an athlete, I would save it for after training to rehydrate. Uh, competition's a little different. Competition day, I, I would do any, you know, whatever you feel like you want to do, and just drink regularly, regularly throughout competition. At any at any opportunity, four to eight ounces. I know you mentioned it, but what's your opinion on intermittent fasting? What's my opinion on IF? Um, That's a loaded question. So first of all, let's define IF. So intermittent fasting is you take periods throughout the day where you don't eat. You, you purposefully do not consume calories. You only drink water, coffee, or tea. Uh, you'll see some IF protocols that say like eat coconut oil. What's coconut oil? Pure fat. I mean, like that doesn't count. Yes, it does. Uh, or like protein shakes are somehow fine. Yeah, those have calories. It's not fasting if you eat calories. Uh, there's two main protocols. You uh, fast for 16 hours of the day, you have an eight hour window. Or the other protocol that's most popular is uh, one day a week you just totally fast. No calories the entire day. Those are the, both, those are the most popular. I've seen research guys where those poor people, they sign up for this research and say, no, I could do it. And uh, every other day fasting, we have, we have that research out there, 48 hour fasting, it's pretty crazy. Um, so those are the two main, 18, 16, eight, or one day. Here's what I'll say with it. You just gotta know how you operate. For an athlete, I'm not a massive fan. For athletes, I'm not a massive fan. 
because you have recovery requirements that other people don't have. And if you're not providing your body with the nutrients that are necessary to repair tissue, which you damage in training and competition, I don't like taking these big stretches of time without providing the basic building blocks for that tissue. Uh, if you're a general, if you, if you just like want to try it, you got to know uh, how you respond. Some people will way super compensate, meaning, meaning they can't control their cravings or their hunger when it's the feeding time, and they actually just end up overdoing it. All right? Some people are fine. Like, I, I've tried intermittent fasting. I tried it in grad, in grad school. I, try, I, liked, I, was the, I didn't like the 16-8. I liked the one day. Uh, but who's known someone that's tried this? How did it go? For like they had weight loss and stuff? Yeah. Same. Uh, who else? How'd it go? You okay? Are they still doing it? Yeah. Yeah? How long? How long? Oh, what's my daddy? Is not like, he's been doing it for six months. Yeah. How about you guys? Here. Here. Still doing it? Not? Who else? I mean, anyone had a like that did not that totally bombed? Anyone have a story like that? Okay. Um, here's maybe the magic of intermittent fasting. It's really good at just doing this. Like, it really is. It, it gives people like a very like clear path and, and way to control this. If you only get eight hours of your day, which most people go noon to eight to eat, and you have, you know that first meal might be kind of big because um, you're hungry. <laughs> Are you gonna wanna eat like every two hours in that time frame? Probably not, it's probably just not gonna happen. So it gives people like a really good, like clear parameters on when they can eat, and even if their diet in that time frame is not the best, likely they just aren't eating as much. Um, you just gotta know how you, hand, you would handle it though. And from a weight loss perspective, if you are an athlete, like, and like a football player, <clears throat> losing weight probably isn't what you wanna be doing. So, I'm not saying it can't work because we actually have a decent sample size in here for people that have had success with it. And um, you just have to know how you operate and you can't sacrifice this. Because that could be at risk as well. If, you, if you're not really paying attention to what you're eating in that, in that eating window, then you, you could be at risk for some nutrient deficiencies. So I'm kind of like neutral on it. I would say if you're an athlete and you want to try it, just like talk to someone like me to kind of guide you through it. Uh, because ultimately people do what they want to do anyway. So um, just just kind of talk with someone or Coach Ox can kind of help you out too. So that's kind of my two cents on that. I'm not down on it necessarily, but there are situations where I don't think it's the greatest thing. All right, other questions? Yeah, about five minutes. Are yeah. there any negative effects from taking creatine? Oh, baby. Yes. <laughs> um, Okay, so creatine. Creatine, first let's define creatine. I wanna make sure everyone knows what we're talking about. So creatine is uh, something that's in our cells. Everyone has this in every single cell of your body and it helps us create energy for the cell. That's its job. Creatine is kinda of like carbohydrates. We, it's in our cells and we utilize it to, to create energy in our cells. It's not a steroid. It's not like, I don't know what else, hormone, it's none of that stuff. Every time you eat uh, most of the things on that protein list, you're consuming dietary creatine, especially beef and chicken and pork, um, and oddly enough, cod is the highest. Uh, so that's what it is, it's just a nutrient, it's an energy um, source for the cell. And why do people, so why do people typically take creatine? Are you stronger? Yeah, it's, it's a, typically marketed as a sports supplement, uh, especially for people who want to gain muscle mass and things like that, get stronger get, uh, and get bigger. Uh, interestingly, there are over a thousand published research studies on creatine. 
All right? Think about that's crazy. That's a, that's a lot. A thousand published studies. Eighty percent of those studies, which is better than some drug, some evidence we have on drugs, shows that it's effective for that purpose of getting people stronger, getting people uh, bigger. If that's the goal, uh, speed, power, all of it, really effective. Where now? So now we're kind of like, yeah, we know what we got with creatine on that perspective. Now everything is on creatine that's coming out is health related, heart health, brain health, concussion prevention, and things like that is where most of the creatine research is, is going. It's really, really interesting. Uh, and actually what the funny thing is we're finding it's good for all of it. Yeah, good for your heart, good for your brain. There are some creatine researchers out there that think the NCAA should mandate creatine supplementation for football players, and then I would say soccer players, because soccer players get concussions too. Um, and the only reported side effect in those, remember, 1,000 studies. So if people's kidneys were exploding, or their livers were exploding, <laughs> or all these other things you hear about creatine, you would see that somewhere, and it's not there. All right, so who's heard creatine causes cramping? Okay, who's heard creatine causes muscle strains and pulls? I mean, Division one football players have taken it, wrestlers have taken it. They, they've done creatine studies where, oh man, it's not the exact amount, but it's something crazy, like 30 grams a day for a year. No side, no, no uh, negative side effects. I'm not saying everyone needs to go do that now. All right, don't get them like, oh, 50 grams, <laughs> okay? Um, but it has a very, very like long history of being safe, and now we're seeing that it's good for brain and cognitive function, especially as you age, muscle health as you age, uh, heart health as you age. Um, so as of right now, the only side effect that we know happens with creatine is muscle gain, weight gain through muscle tissue. If you train that way. Right? If you don't train in a way that will give you big muscles, then it's not gonna give you that. But it'll still help on these other fronts. So I'm, uh, creatine in my mind is now a health supplement, not only a sports supplement. And if you're like wondering this now, yes, I take creatine every day. Five to 10 grams. So, yeah. Yes? To ask just one final question, because we all have college students here. If you give us one, one final just tidbit of information about what these students can do now in regards to their nutrition that will impact their future years, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. You just one little bit of advice. What could they do now? Right now, I would just be more aware of what your nutrition actually is like. <laughs> I would just start using this as your guide, where are you at on it? and just identify a few things that you could work on that are like no-brainers. Like what's something that you could do this week that you could like do in your sleep that you know would have be effective. Uh, and I'll also say that you've probably heard a Coach Ox say this, just start doing it now because I promise you this is the easiest time of life it will ever be for you. You will not, when you graduate and leave these walls, you can't just walk into a building and it's all prepared for you and then just dump your tray and your, your, dump your dishes at a, a conveyor belt and they get taken away for you. I know, I mean, I think Coach Ox is gonna try to put that in his house or something, but <laughs> uh, it doesn't have, it's not, that's not how life is. So if you can get the principles down now of like getting this stuff, then after that, the cooking, the cleaning, the time management is going to be a lot easier if you already know what you can do. That would be my final. Thank you. Great questions, guys. That was awesome.